Jamie, it's your turn. The grace and peace of Christ be with you. I'm Jamie Orr, and I'm, it's my joy to worship with you on this day, the day of Pentecost. Let me start with uh, some announcements. And if you miss anything, you can find them in the weekly update email or on our Facebook page. Uh, this evening, the Evolved Creation Spirituality Sacred Gathering will meet at 6 p.m. through Zoom. And you can find the link for that uh, on our Facebook page or in the bulletin. Through the week, we have online gatherings, Living the Questions, on every other Wednesday morning at 9.30. And this week, uh, June 30th, is one of those times. There's a children's Bible study on demand. And if you'd like to have a children's Bible study for your uh, conversation between the pastor and your children, please reach out to him uh, through his email. The pastor's office hours are Tuesday morning from 9 to 11. And we have a social hour on Saturdays, I believe it is Saturday mornings through Zoom. Our church is involved with Feed Anne Arundel campaign and there's an appeal for support to them. You can find information on that through our website in the bulletin or at our Facebook page. And there's a special invitation this evening to participate in a viewing of the cross and the lynching tree, uh, a, uh, a, a live viewing of the Reverend Dr. Otis Moss's junior, junior cinematic sermon preached at Trinity United Church of Christ in Chicago. Uh, and this is a requiem for Ahmad Arbery. Uh, information on that again is on our Facebook page, uh, in our weekly update or at the United Church of Christ page. As today is a high holy day of in the Christian calendar, we'll celebrate communion together. All you need is something that can serve as bread and something from the fruit of the vine. Friends, let us all join together in our call to worship. It came like a whooshing wind, filling an entire house of fearful people. Their eyes lit up, their imaginations took fire. They opened their mouths proclaiming faith, love and hope in every language. God loved all people in every language, every expression. They no longer had reason to fear for hope had become their language of love. So gather us, O oh God, in our rooms. Let the Holy Spirit fill our hearts and light us up with holy imagination. Open our ears. That we may listen. And our lips. So our mouths may proclaim your praise. Peace be with you. And also with you. And share a sign of peace by commenting on the live stream page or send a text to someone or just shout peace to the world.
God, we enter here after an incredible week. Yesterday, a rocket sent two human beings into space, astounding us with what we are capable of. Yet our cities burned as rage overflowed after the brutal killing of another child of God. And here we gather a people who know you because of the miracle of Pentecost, when flames of fire lit the tongues of the disciples, shaping them into apostles who proclaimed your word and who would be silent no more. Bless us, God, but take from us our fear. Let the flames of your word alight upon us so that someday we, as with all your children, may be silent no more as our mouths proclaim your praise rather than our tears. Amen. People of God, trusting in God's forgiveness, let us in silence confess our failings and acknowledge our part in the pain of the world. Before God, with you, the people of God, I confess to turning away from God in the ways I wound my life, the lives of others, and the life of the world. May God forgive you, Christ renew you, and the Spirit enable you to grow in love. Amen. Before God, with the people of God, we confess to turning away from God in the ways we wound our lives, the lives of others, and the life of the world. May God forgive you, Christ renew you, and the Spirit enable you to grow in love. Amen. So today, we're going to share a Pentecost story. And the Pentecost story is this moment where a lot of people who are a little afraid um, got the courage to say something. And to help me share the story, every night in our home, we have a little bit of a story time. And over the course of those story time, we've been able to give some different characters some voices. This is, this is Pokey the Triceratops. And um, I don't know what this guy's name is yet. We haven't used him yet, but Floyd provided him as one of the storytellers today to help us tell the Pentecost story. So we're going to share this Pentecost story today. Um, and so how we're going to share it is, is like this. So after Jesus was back, so this week or last week, we talked about Jesus going away. Jesus left. Jesus has gone back to God. And so the disciples are trying to figure out, okay, great. The person who taught us how to do everything so let's pretend that this is one of the disciples, this is Pokey. So the person who taught us to do everything has just disappeared. Now we got to figure out how to be the church now, and we don't understand what to do. I know. I had no idea. I don't know what to do either. So we're stuck here in this room trying to figure out what we're supposed to do. And then, and then, And then, fire. We're sitting in the room. We're sitting in this room. And all of a sudden, these fire, these flames, these tongues of flame came down from outside of, this, of everything. It came down onto our tongues. Now, I don't know about you, but the idea of fire coming down on my tongue sounds like it would hurt. Have you ever had a fireball? No. Well, it's like a it's like a piece of candy, but it's filled with cinnamon. It's really hot. Was it like that? It was more, but it didn't burn, but it made me want to speak. And so all of a sudden people started speaking. We went out into the places where everybody was and we started speaking. You see, we'd been afraid to speak before because we saw what happened to Jesus. We weren't sure what we were supposed to say. And now, and now, and now, 
all of a sudden, we realized that we had the words. The words that we were supposed to share with everybody. You see, everybody else was scared too. After Jesus died, they thought, well, we don't know. Maybe we just have to do things exactly the way that we always did. So what we did was we just sat up in our rooms and we were really sad for a long time. But then God sent this spirit, these flames, this, this motivation. And we realized that actually God was still with us. Even though Jesus had left, God was still with us. And we needed to go and tell everybody else that life could be a little bit better and a little bit different. And so we went out into the streets, out into the streets, and we shared this good news with everybody, that things could be different, that we didn't need to be afraid. And so that's what people did. Thank you, Pokey. You're welcome. I'm not a very good ventriloquist, by the way. Thank you, Bear. See, we're very original with names too, and Stripes. When we get scared, sometimes we don't want to share our story. Sometimes we think that there's no way to see things differently. But the good news is that God is still with us even when we're scared. And God gives us the words, sometimes not right away, maybe sometimes a little bit later, to share the stories that we need to share. So if things seem different right now, if things seem a little bit scary right now, just know that God is still with us, never left us, but God is still with us and is helping us figure out the words that we need to share and the stories that we need to share. And when we get it, it'll be like a light bulb or a tongue of flame. They didn't have light bulbs back in the disciples' day that will go off and we'll realize we have a story to share. We have good news to share. It can be different. So friends, on this Pentecost Sunday, be reminded that God is with us and that we can continue to share that good news together with Pokey or without, but with you. Let us pray. Loving God, thank you for sending your spirit. Thank you for sending us the words that we need to speak. Help us to know that if we don't have the words right now, they will eventually come. Give us the patience to wait and the courage to share our story when the time is right. So we pray the prayer which Jesus taught us, saying, <clears throat> Our Father, Mother, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us of our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Uh, for those of you who may not know me yet, my name is Ashley Dawson. I've been a member of UCCA for several years now, but I'm currently away in Ohio where I attend university for music and theater. Thank God for technology allowing us to be brought together for this morning. My thanks for technology is actually quite ironic considering Pastor Ryan asked me to speak about the pandemic and how it's affected my faith. Full disclosure, I'm going to speak quite frankly, and some of it will involve mental health issues. Although this health crisis has affected all of us in different ways, the way that it unfolded for me felt nothing less than a scene from a horror film. On March 10th at 6 a.m., I had loaded into a van with over a dozen of my classmates en route to New York City. This was two days after New York State 
announced its 105th case total. By the time we arrived in Secaucus, New Jersey, about 4.30 p.m., Governor Cuomo had announced his plans to quarantine the entire area of New Rochelle, and the universities in Ohio were beginning to announce closure in response to emergency proclamations of our Governor DeWine. By 5.30 p.m., it was confirmed we were to turn around and return immediately to school and wait out the remainder of our spring break. That was the start of a remarkably fast decline for me. Because you see, while to some it was just a spring break trip to New York City, for me it was an experience that proved my worth and my capability. I had been selected to be a student to participate in a voice workshop with a Broadway music director. That opportunity was a way for me to prove to myself I was good enough, and that was the first thing the pandemic took from me. Next, it took my friends. Spring break was extended by a week. Campus was closed for the remainder of the semester. I watched from afar, since I don't live on campus, as my classmates and friends packed up their dorm rooms. I didn't know when or if I would ever see the graduating seniors again. The pandemic took my freedom. I became fully isolated and confined to my apartment. I spent every possible minute inside with my dog, Remy. Going to Walmart for groceries caused me to have panic attacks. The pandemic took my sanity. <laughs> I was absolutely lost. I saw no end to my situation, alone, trapped in a state that is not mine, away from all of my family, all of my friends, and unable to even receive the comfort of my professors here who have really become like a second family. I spiraled quickly into a dark and deep depression. For several weeks, I was barely functional. I left the house rarely, it was just not an option for me. So a friend of mine picked up all my groceries. I used laundry drop-off service because even just the five minutes it required me to be out of my apartment was absolutely unbearable. I was so hurt. I found myself asking why. Why could all of this be happening? Why were these opportunities snatched from me? Is this some sort of punishment, some sort of sign that I made the wrong decision to pursue this passion of education in music and theater? Why was I stuck alone? Why were my friends, my loved ones stuck on the front lines? Why did I have to watch another pandemic strike so much more deadly than the last when I already lost one friend to the last pandemic of H1N1? For anyone who has never experienced the dark misery of soul crushing clinical depression, you are blessed. It can make your very soul hurt. Those of us with existing mental health issues were so far underwater that the sun had long been drowned out. While the neurotypical masses learned and preached that it's okay to not be okay. But those of us, the ill, we knew long ago that okay is a subjective term. And our okay is not the okay of the masses. Sometimes our okay is brushing your teeth for the first time in three days or finally remembering to eat more than one meal. I was grieving. We all were grieving as a community, as a state, as a country. We grieved these losses, the things that the pandemic stole so cruelly. Selfishly, we were angry and sad for our personal losses but also for the countless lives lost to this awful disease. We became angry, angry at misinformation, angry with the leadership or lack thereof of our local and national government officials, angry with the disproportionate amount of our black brothers and sisters who were dying from this virus, angry from ignorance. We stewed, I stewed, I saw no end to this. I had no faith I would survive my semester and I considered dropping most of my classes. I had no faith that I would be able to remain alone here in Ohio. I was losing faith that I was cut out for this path of life. But you know how sometimes people really surprise you to the point where you can't even deny there's another force involved? Whether you call it God or the Holy Spirit or even deep human compassion, something worked its energy in your life. For me, this came in a few ways, and maybe you can recognize some of these in your life as well. One, being contacted by multiple members of our church to check on me, even if I really didn't want to talk. Two, being given the grace and understanding of my professors that allowed me to turn in work weeks late 
as long as I kept in contact with them and let them know how I was doing. 2.5, the random photos that my professors would send me of their kids and pets to bring me a smile. Three, our service is being moved online, allowing me to remain in my depression pajamas while still being a part of our church family and sing with the choir. Four, new antidepressants and free therapy. <laughs> it worked in a couple weeks. Five, multiple offers of any time, phone calls and texts. Six, technology. While Zoom University was awful, being able to FaceTime and occasionally Zoom with my loved ones reminded me that I did have a support system and I was never alone. Seven, the grace of people who were willing to listen and stand by me through a very dark time. Those seven and a half things are just a handful of ways that I experienced grace in the past months of this pandemic. And for me, faith is a very interesting journey. I do see it as grace. I see it as connection. I see it as a belief in something more. I don't see faith as a necessary daily proclamation to be shouted from the rooftops, but rather a deep bond between God, the world, and myself. New things happen almost every day that remind me I'm loved by God. Small things like pictures of my niece and nephew playing, big things, wonderful opportunities, and climbing out of a depressive spell. And even things that have nothing to do with me, like seeing strangers being kind to other strangers. I'm pretty sure I'm not alone in saying that I absolutely loathe this pandemic and what it's doing to the world. But I also really hope I'm not alone in saying that I still experience the grace that strengthens my faith and my trust that no matter what happens, I'm loved. Listen now in the reading of scripture for the word and wisdom of God. Our first reading is from the book of Acts, the second chapter, the first 21 verses. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven, there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as a fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one of them heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, are not all of these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, in our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others sneered and said they are filled with new wine. Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days, it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in the heaven above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Thank you, Jamie. And Ashley, thank you for that testimony of faith for 
what you've shared and your views and your vulnerability. It was beautiful. Thank you. Our second reading comes from the book of Numbers, chapter 11, verses 24 to 13, in the New Revised Standard Version. So Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord, and he gathered 70 elders of the people and placed them all around the tent. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke to him and took some of the spirit that was on him and put it on the 70 elders. And when the spirit rested on them, they prophesied, but they did not do so again. Two men remained in the camp, one named Eldad and the other named Medad, and the spirit rested on them. They were among those registered, but they had not gone out to the tent, and so they prophesied in the camp. And a young man ran and told Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. And Joshua, son of Nun, the assistant of Moses, one of his chosen men said, My Lord, Moses, stop them. But Moses said to him, Are you jealous for my sake? Would that all the Lord's people were prophets, and that the Lord would put his spirit on them. And Moses and the elders of Israel returned to the camp. Would that we all could hear the Spirit of God and share it. For the Word of God in Scripture, for the Word of God among us, for the Word of God within us, thanks be to God. Thank you, Kathleen. Please pray with me. O God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be beautiful in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So today is Pentecost, a day where some people sing happy birthday to the church. It's the birth of the church. It's a high holy day. Some people wear red pajamas because we can now. We don't have to come to church. Some people are putting on red or bits of red. It's almost like our St. Patrick's Day ritual, but instead of green, we're in, we're in red. 
Some of us are wearing red hats. Some of us are wearing red ribbons. Some of us are thinking about fire and flames. But Pentecost is a day when a group of the faithful are all sitting in an upper room, scared of what will happen to their bodies if they step out of it, until a fire moves them out of that room. That might sound a little familiar right now. Like it or not, we are often moved by fire. God knows this. It's why God speaks through fire. To Moses, it was fire and a burning bush, but the bush was not consumed. Elijah, a still, small voice, speaking after the fire, but not in it. Here, around us in our cities, fire. We even have a churchy word for it, theophany. It's when God appears to human beings, and fire is one of God's favorite ways of communicating to humankind. But God is never in the fire. The fire draws attention to the presence of God. A burning bush that wasn't burning, a fire in the dark night, as with Elijah, a column of fire leading the Hebrews to freedom from Egypt at night. We know fire is effective. After all, it's how we get s'mores when we're trying to sit around the campfire. Fire can be effective in pulling us together. But when people are angry, we burn things. It's related to the sense that fire cleanses things, and after ashes are settled, a reboot is given. Paul wrote about it in Corinthians. The fire will test the quality of each person's work from first, the le- first letter to the Corinthians 3.13, referring to that inevitable challenge we will all face at some time in our life, which will reveal if our life is built on Christ, is built on our faith, or upon gold, or silver, or other people's labor. We have been burning down cities since time began. So has God. For the sin of being inhospitable to guests, God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah with sulfur and fire. When a city, which is supposed to be a place for human communal dwelling, becomes hostile or unwelcome, we rain sulfur and fire down upon it still. James Baldwin, who titled his seminal 1963 book, The Fire Next Time, named it that from a line in the African-American spiritual, Mary don't you weep. The line goes, God gave Noah the rainbow sign, no more water, the fire next time. The first time humanity failed, God sent water. The spiritual is saying that the next time we fail, it won't be water God sends, it will be fire. Trevor Noah, the Daily Show host whose 2016 book, Born a Crime, outlines how his mixed-race status as, as a child of a white man and a black mother was illegal. Just the very nature of his birth, of his personhood, was illegal in South Africa as little as 20 years ago. Made a point, Noah made a point via YouTube yesterday that it's perhaps not unique, but timely. As our cities are burning, he's saying perhaps we should look at it through the lens of a broken social contract. We who have the privilege to move about in the world without fear based on the color of our skin have a social contract that both enforces our behavior but also sets the expectations for the behavior of others. It is so ubiquitous for those of us who are white that we cannot imagine there is any other decent way to be in the world. This is what has made, for some, President Trump's behavior so outrageous. It violates a social contract, a sense of decency that we have come to expect. Looting, setting buildings on fire, this also violates that social contract. Protest, but do it peacefully, we say, and change will come. But likewise... There are many people who say that the social contract has been violated because families might not be held as as strongly important as they once remember. 
They've seen the deconstruction of the family unit by forces, often progressive, that challenge the world to reimagine what love looks like. This can feel outrageous and a violation of decency as well. But then there's the people who have seen the social contract ripped up in front of them every day of their lives. Trevor Noah makes the point so well. In the course of a week, we have been able to see it. Still reeling from the murder of Ahmad Arbery in Georgia, a video went viral of a white woman, Amy Cooper, calling the police on an African-American man, Christian Cooper, no relation, who asked her to put her dog on a leash. He was out birding in New York City's Central Park in a par area called the Ramble. It's beautiful. For those who have seen the video, we saw how she weaponized his race as she called the police, saying over and over again that an African-American man is threatening me. She knew something we all know, that police historically have reacted more violently towards black bodies, and she used that power to threaten him. He videoed it. He stood his ground. And we all were confirmed in what we knew to be true. And then a man, George Floyd, was murdered by a white police officer, Derek Chauvin, by placing his knee on a man's neck for seven minutes as he pled for his mother, for water, and breath. While this incident is itself new, the occurrence of such incidents of violence to black bodies is not. The fire has come to Minneapolis, New York, Los Angeles, Baltimore, Washington, D.C., Atlanta, and so many other cities across the country. And those who think the social contract should stand don't want the fire to come. We denounce it. We demand that the spirit fit into the contract as we understand it. But for those whose bodies bear the scars of a broken social contract, living in a, living in a country where they are more likely to succumb to COVID-19 amongst a myriad of other health concerns, more likely to be impoverished, more likely to be killed, more likely to die in our wars, and more likely to have a tenth of the household income of a white or household wealth of a white family. What value is there in preserving, in preserving a dehumanizing social contract? Is this not the same fire that caught the disciples who were sitting in that upper room after their Lord and Savior had been denied water? Is this not the same fire that caught after his breath was racked out of him? Crucifixion was a horrific way to die. The body literally collapsed upon itself. Lungs could draw in littler and littler breath. You thirsted in the hot sun. The body of Jesus was that of an oppressed people under a Roman imperial heel, a people whose whole history was wrapped up in being oppressed, whose story traces to slavery in Egypt, exile in Babylon, vassalhood under Persia, and then the violent occupation by Rome, enforced by so-called good Jews who were complicit because it was easier or expedient. They were fed up, and God gave them fire. It lit on their tongues. That fire was the gospel and the good news that the oppressed will inherit the kingdom of God. And they went out into the world armed with the fiery gospel to burn down the ways of evil. This evil, complicit world that had ripped up their social contract, had ripped up their promise, had ripped up everything that they were supposed to have, that they were promised from time beginning in the story, it had been ripped up. So they went out and it resonated. The ears that could now understand what they were saying shared their anger at this unjust world. They had lived 
lived under the heels of despots and torturers all across that land. You heard that reading from Acts, listing each and every one of these places, places of oppression, places where people were hurt, were starving, were bruised, were beaten, were tired. The Spirit entered into those ears and they heard those words of an angry disciple. And it resonated in their bones. It was the fire next time that had caught. Church, hear this. The flames of our cities are Pentecost flames. The voices of angry black people is the language of God. There was a Bangladeshi restaurant that burned in Minneapolis, Gandhi Mahal. The owner, Ruhel Islam, said over the phone when he learned the news that his restaurant was fire, on fire, let my building burn. Justice needs to be served. The next day, as his building smoldered, he repeated his support for the protest, saying, we can rebuild a building, but we cannot rebuild a human. The restaurant was collateral damage. Protesters had set the nearby third precinct police building ablaze. During the protest, the restaurant was a field hospital for people injured. It seems as if the owners tried to do everything right, but their building was destroyed. It benefited from a system that had, has for far too long denied and excluded the true value of black lives. The GoFundMe pages that had been set up for this restaurant have raised at least $100,000 as of the time I wrote this message. But the attitude of the owner, Ruhel Islam, is important. Let the building burn. Justice is being served. I'm not advocating violence, but I'm remembering as I flip through the pages of the Holy Scriptures that God comes as fire. The gospel comes as fire. And it ignited the tongues of the disciples. And it continues to do so. Those disciples had been hiding, but once the fire came, they jumped out into the streets, speaking the language of the peoples of the earth, a language that recognized pain and harm and oppression. They left the comfort of the place afforded them, the comfort of their own expectations, some way to muddle through and just keep going, some way to just marginalize and be to the side. They left that place because the fire had lit on their tongues and they jumped into action. Church, are we going to stay in our rooms waiting for God to come to us the way we think we'd accept God? Sure, God meets us where we are. But have we forgotten Job? God met Job where he was. But God did not speak as a still, small voice or in a way that Job wanted to hear. To the tormented Job, God spoke from a whirlwind, demanding of us who think we understand rightness and justice and saying, and here are the words from Job, Who is this who darkens counsel in words without knowledge? Gird your loins like a man that I may ask you and you can inform me. Where were you when I founded earth? Tell if you know understanding. Who fixed its measures? Do you know? Or who stretched a line upon it? In what were its sockets sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? Who hedged the sea with double doors when it gushed forth from the womb? When I made cloud its clothing and thick mist its swaddling bands. We are in a whirlwind. 
For many, our social contract has been broken. It's being broken, but it needed to be broken. The question in front of us now is, how will we rebuild from the ashes? Knowing why there are ashes in the first place is one part of this. But acting on that knowledge is something else. The disciples knew full well who killed Jesus, and they were angry and scared about it. But it took the fire next time to come, to light them up, to get them to move. It had to destroy their pretensions of comfort, their thoughts that they could blend into the background again, go be so-called good people and just live their lives. The fire came for them, and it wrecked their lives for God's sake. It called them into the streets, into the marketplaces, into the places where injustice was baked into the very bricks and paving stones and demanded to be let loose in the world to burn down the pathways of oppression and let the people of God go free. So on this Pentecost Sunday, do you feel the fire? Do you see it burning? Does it scare you? Because it sure scares me but I have something to do. I have a child named Floyd, and his skin is brown. He bears in his blood the lineages of slaves and slaveholder, but he is viewed by our nation as the descendant of slaves, and too much of our history shows that that society will value his life a little less. And I won't let that happen. I won't. The fire is in my bones, and it is consuming my reticence and my desire to maintain a false peace. But I also want to win. And thank God, we have been building power and praying with people who have been on, in this for longer than I have. But we are called in a Pentecost moment. The fire is lit. God is here. The Spirit has been sent. The gospel has been catching fire since the first disciples felt it on their tongues. The question is, do you feel it? And how is it setting fire in your bones to proclaim the gospel? The Lord be with you. People of God, we come now to a time where we invite you to share the gifts that God has given for the work of the church. These can be gifts as often of time and of talent, but also of money. They help support the work of this church so that we can be able to carry on what we are called to do, and how we are called to work, and how we are called to be disciples in a place and a time such as this. So people of God, if you are able to give, we invite you to do so by going to our website, uccannapolis.org forward slash giving. There's a text to give number in your bulletin as well. We thank you for all your gifts and your giving. Amen. <laughs>
Please pray with me. Gracious and loving God, we give you thanks for the ability to be able to give. We give you thanks for the gifts that are given and received. And we give you thanks that we are able to continue to do the work of proclaiming the gospel, of letting the fire catch, of being able to shout your name to the rooftops, to be able to connect with one another, to be there in times of trouble and need and joy and in sorrow. Bless these gifts and all this giving. Amen. Friends, we come now to a time where we share our prayers with one another. And we invite you to write the prayers on the YouTube comment stream right there. I've got it right in front of me. And I'll be able to pull it up and, and share those prayers with, with, uh, with us together. So if there are any prayers that you brought with you into this place, please type them there. I will repeat it and we'll say, God, in your grace, hear our prayers. God, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Or as is so often the case, God, in your grace and mercy, hear our prayers. I start, of course, with prayers for our nation. As we have been locked down for a long time with a deadly virus going around, a virus that is disproportionately affecting people of color, I pray for the people who are on the front lines in health care, on the front lines in mental health care, on the front lines in first aid. We pray for our nation, its people, the people called specifically to work on this. God, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We pray for people who are angry, for far too long whose bodies have been treated as less, even though we wish to deny it, that we wish that were not true. History's facts bear out a different reality. So we pray that the fire may catch us, burn away the cobwebs in our minds and the reticence in our hearts to see the anger and to be the people of God responding in the way that we are called. God, in your grace and mercy, hear our prayers. And if there are any other prayers that people wish to offer, please type them in now. And if not, that's okay. I do offer up a prayer for a friend who is um, our friend Monica, who's been leading um, our feed, the Feed Anne Arundel efforts with ACT. Um, she is a first-time grandmother as of this week, so we pray for that child um, born this past week. God, in your grace, hear our prayers. A prayer from Rick Dove for people searching for a peaceful place in their minds during this turbulent time. God, in your grace and mercy, hear our prayers. From Kathy, for the families that have experienced so much injustice, for members of my family to protect um, them from hatred. You are loved by all. God, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Prayer for Hildy, uh, for her longtime neighbor, Jerry, who died last evening. Jerry has been lifted up in our prayers now for some time. We pray for Jerry and we pray for in the presence of his wife and daughter, and we pray for his family who has been there with him. We pray for his wife, Carol, and we pray for her family as well. God, in your mercy, hear our prayers. And people of God, we take these prayers, the ones that we have shared, the ones that we have held into our hearts, and we fold them together in a prayer for peace, saying, O loving God, spirit of hope and peace, lead us from false my apologies. Lead us from falsehood to truth, from death to life. Lead us from falsehood to truth. Lead us from despair to hope, from fear to trust. Lead us from hate to love, from war to peace. Let peace fill our hearts, our world, our universe. Peace, peace, peace.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to God. Let us give thanks to God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. For you, Creator God, the valleys laugh and sing, and the trees of the field clap their hands. Your earth summons us to break silence and be one with the song of creation. We give you thanks and praise. For you, God, of all the church in its myriad forms and countless languages honors its Savior. Millions upon millions invite us to be one with them in the drama of worship. We give you thanks and praise. In heaven, beyond our seeing, the angels and saints are caught up in song, and those we have loved and lost are part of that great company. They call us to be one with the harmony of heaven. We give you thanks and praise. So gladly we join our voices to those of earth, sea, and sky in the universal hymn of praise which echoes through time and eternity. Holy, 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 God of power and might, heaven and earth is full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Gracious and merciful God, you have brought us to your table, a table a set with the stuff of the earth, a bread and the fruit of the vine, the stuff of life. Throughout time and creation, you have journeyed with us, calling us to be with you, calling us to feast with you, calling us to break bread with sisters and brothers and one another. On the night before he died, Jesus brought his friends around a table and he broke bread with them and he took the cup with them. He shared his life with them. By breaking bread and sharing cup, sharing the cup, we continue to participate in the lives of one another, the life of Christ, and the life of God. So God bless this bread and this cup, and the bread and the cup that are all across this place, all across this land, and all those who are sharing this now or in some recording future. That it may be for us the stuff of life, the nourishment of the Spirit, to light us on fire, to proclaim the gospel, and have the courage to be your disciples. Amen. Amen. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. We break this bread as a sign and a symbol of Jesus for the life that he broke for us and the life that he continues to make possible for us. And we take this cup poured out for us in love, representing the very lifeblood of Jesus. May it be for us the body and the blood and the blessing of the life of Christ shared freely with all who come. As those who have been invited to this table feed on this holy food through which God comes to us, so that we can come to God. O brother Jesus, we have been guests at your table. Come with us wherever we go and be present in all we share. Summon out in us whom you have fed generosity of spirit to ensure that all the hungry are nourished and earth's barren places are fertile with food, faith, hope, and love. Amen.
Friends, before we conclude our service, we invite you to join us for a time of fellowship that happens on Zoom just after the service. There's a link that was sent out this morning, an email where you can join us all. And I think the link is even in the service order if you're using electronic. Yes, it is. So if you're using electronically, you can click on that link, come and join us. Uh, we look forward to seeing you. And it starts pretty much right after this, about two or three minute break. So we hope that you'll join us so that we can continue to share and connect with one another as the people of God. But friends, the fire is there. God has spoken to us through fire many, many times. And as we look at the country, this is not just burning physically, but burning in the hearts of our people and the people of God. We invite you to hear God's Spirit calling to you and to let the Spirit lead you. Jamie, if you'll close us with the grace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the companionship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Amen.